The Inside Transportation Podcast is sponsored by Ford Motor Company. Built on the belief that freedom of movement drives human progress. From connectivity to autonomy, AI to machine learning, Ford has one simple goal, to improve mobility for its customers. To learn more about Ford's work in mobility, autonomous vehicles, and their global efforts to improve mobility for its customers, visit corporate.ford.com. That's corporate.ford.com. Fenwick & West is one of the world's first and leading law firms dedicated to technology and transportation, and we're lucky to have them as a sponsor of the Inside Transportation podcast. Learn more about how Fenwick can help companies tackle the complex legal and business issues of autonomous transportation at Fenwick.com. That's F-E-N-W-I-C-K.com. Today on the Inside Transportation Podcast, we have a very special guest, Michael Bertov, an inventor, entrepreneur, and the founder and CEO of Geo Orbital. If that company name sounds familiar, you may recognize it from season nine of Shark Tank. Geo Orbital is a wheel that allows you to retrofit your bike into a personal electric vehicle. First of all, Michael, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Oh, I love it. Thanks for having me. Great. First off, I know you get this a lot. But what was that experience like filming Shark Tank? Um, I'm a huge fan of the show, and I'm genuinely curious. Like, well, what's that experience like? Oh man, that's I can talk about that. That's a that's a topic for a whole for a whole hour, <laughs> two hours. But I'll keep it brief. You know, one of the really amazing things of on being on TV, being on reality TV like Shark Tank, is just how much you're in awe from all of the production. Um, it is television. You're in a sound lot in L.A. Uh, it, it is quite an amazing experience, something that I hadn't felt before that moment. Uh, it's very different from your day to day kind of interaction or startup pitches. Right, right. Um, that's amazing. I mean, you guys did you, you didn't end up getting an investment on the show, right? But you we did deliver a bike, I think, to one of the sharks, right? Yeah, a couple of sharks actually bought on the show, which was really cool. And then uh, I met with Kevin O'Leary in Miami, personally delivered his wheel to him. Um, you know, we, we chatted for a little while. It was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, first of all, tell me a little bit about your background. Um, why are you so passionate about micromobility and sustainable mobility? And let me just say this. You were passionate about micromobility before it was cool, <laughs> I think, personally. Yeah, I don't know if it's cool now, but I appreciate the sentiment. Um, I so I love mobility. I I have a kind of a weird background. So I, I come from a lot of different places. I actually started my career, as funny as it is, in the Peace Corps, uh, mm. serving you know underdeveloped international communities. But eventually, I kind of I, I I grew up, and I think as part of growing up, I regressed a little bit. So I went back to my roots and I started creating things. Um, mm -hmm. And I started founding companies. So this is actually the fourth company that I founded and led. Um, oh, wow. And I've been doing this for almost 20 years at this point. I brought a bunch of companies from zero to millions in revenue and millions in funding. Um, and that's really my passion. So I love creating things. And one of the things that I was passionate about about six years ago when I founded Geo Orbital was mobility, urban mobility. I saw a real issue. Um, and I had an idea for a new type of wheel, um, a wheel with a battery and a motor built in. Uh, and I built it. I built a prototype. I built a team, uh, found funding, uh, and launched it into the market. And it's been a, it's been a whirlwind ride. Right. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you came up with this idea, because it seems so like such a simple idea, right? I mean, um, but I'm sure the execution of it presented some challenges. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about kind of the development process and what some of the challenges you faced uh, in developing this product? So it's really fascinating. So I am not an engineer myself. I have zero mm, engineering okay. background or credentials or anything like that. Not software or hardware. I know nothing about engineering. I'm kind of a tinkerer, whatever. I, I do little things here or there, but I'm definitely not an engineer. Um, and then in 2011 or 2012, somewhere around there, I was watching Tron. 
um, the movie. Mm. I, I don't know if you remember. It's a Disney movie. Yes, yes. Always um, a good inspiration to, to always watch good, right? <laughs> I was I was just watching a movie, uh, and I was running a different startup that I had I had founded at that time, a human resources software company. Uh, but I was watching. I was like, I got this idea. So in Tron, they have these motorcycles that have hollow wheels. Uh, they're called orbital wheels. Now uh, these are basically wheels without a hub. Uh, and I was looking at that. I was like, that is really cool, but it's really stupid. You know, you can put all of these components inside that wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and why hasn't that been done before? So I looked everywhere, everywhere. And I couldn't find anything that even remotely resembled what I was thinking. I was thinking, well, listen, real engineers probably would have done it if it was doable, right? It's such an obvious idea in retrospect. Right. Uh, but nobody's done it. So I did it. I built a prototype literally in my kitchen. Um, and then, what were you using to kind of build that? Did you just get like the wheel off of your bike and just uh, I didn't even, bought some well, stuff so at Radio it was Shack? Too big. And... <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was going to do that with a full grown-up bike, but it wouldn't fit into my kitchen. There's a lot of stuff that goes in there. Uh, I live in a little apartment in Boston at the time. So, right. I mean, I started with a kid's bike. I literally got a kid's bike. It was like a 12-inch wheel maybe. Something designed for like three or four-year-olds, something of that sort. Uh, and I just decided to, th how do I do this? Like, where do I go from here? So I had all these crazy ideas in my mind. I went to like Home Depot. I went to junkyards. Um, I just scoured for parts online from pretty much everywhere I could find. And I just cobbled something together that made it actually that kind of worked. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend that had a four-year-old at the time. And um, she put her four-year-old on the bike and it broke immediately. But you know what? It got to like <laughs> five feet of distance and then it lit well, on good fire thing it was quite a friend. literally. That's all, that's all I'm right, going to say. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, and I don't know why the hell she trusted me with it, but she did. But one of the most amazing things about, you know, inventing something that's radically new uh, is that, especially if you're not, if you don't have any credentials in that space, is that really the whole world is kind of against you. Uh, everybody, everybody you tell about this idea that you have uh, thinks, well, listen, this is not going to work. This is stupid. You're not an engineer. And it's the same exact sentiment that I had. If it was possible, a real engineer would have done it already. So mm -hmm. it's this idea of launching a new product, a new idea, and literally the entire world is, is against you, especially the more clear um, the vision is. So the more obvious something is in retrospect, the more pushback you really get from the market. And that was quite something to me. Uh, other companies I had started, I didn't, we didn't face that. I never had that much, you know, ingrained visceral opposition to my idea, but this, I, this idea I did. Um, and that's part of the reason that it became so revolutionary. And now you look at it, like you said now, and you think, Oh, this is obvious. And yeah, right. it's obvious in retrospect. I guess in terms of producing a prototype, right, in your kitchen or, 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 you know, in your apartment in Boston, um, going from that prototype to, like, full-scale production, what are some of the challenges you face um, or faced uh, in kind of getting to that stage, right? Well, the most important thing is finding a team, I think. I think uh, not only for expertise but also for culture, for having somebody with you as part of that startup journey. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard launching a company, uh, psychologically very hard, financially very hard, finding expertise is very hard. Uh, so I was lucky enough to have met some excellent people, uh, in particular, uh, the person who became our CTO. Uh, he had just left SpaceX or he was considering leaving SpaceX um, right, right. to join, to do something new. And I met him right at that inflection point. He's like, yeah, this is perfect. This is ideal. Um, so we, we partnered up. This was right after I filed the first patent application, and the timing was just wonderful. And we built up a whole team. Uh, so with his expertise in manufacturing, cost reduction, supply chain, uh, we built up a team of uh, about 10 people, I think, by the time we launched. But that presented a new challenge, um, the challenge of funding. So mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how many startups, how many great ideas die because they don't have access to capital. And that capital is really what makes or breaks an early stage company. Um, mm -hmm. I had had startups before, but it's not like I was filthy rich, right? I mean, startup right. founders often are not. We're often very broke for a very long time. Uh, it's one of those like misunderstandings, I think, in the community that entrepreneurs are wealthy. Entrepreneurs are not. Um, right. entre former entrepreneurs are wealthy, the ones that sold their company successfully. But while you're doing <laughs> yes. it, man, you're piss broke. So yeah, you're eating beans. Eating beans and ramen, exactly, exactly. So how do you get the capital? And so 
one of the most amazing things that I think we discovered or I discovered through this journey of geoorbital is alternative sources of funding. Um, and that's actually what I wrote my book about. It's called The Evergreen Startup, um, the entrepreneur's playbook for everything from venture capital to equity crowdfunding. And in The Evergreen Startup, I talk a lot about the alternative sources of capital, um, that idea is really off the beaten path, like, like a new type of wheel uh, could access and use to develop their product. So as far as the challenges, I think the first is the team. Uh, first is having great people around you, the, the right culture, the right effort. And second, it's access to capital. And it, it sounds a little crass, but realistically, with no money, with no cash to buy your cheeseburgers, with no cash to pay your rent, uh, with no cash to buy parts, you're just not going to get far as a company. Right. And we'll have a link to uh, Michael's book in the show notes uh, if you guys want to check that out. But I do have a question. So today, where is Geo Orbital and where do you kind of see yourselves going in the future um, with this uh, project? But before we discuss this, let's take a quick break here on the Inside Transportation podcast. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. I just want to let you know that this episode of Inside Transportation is sponsored by our friends at the Ford Motor Company. Built on the belief that freedom of movement drives human progress from connectivity to autonomy, Ford has one simple goal, and that's to improve the mobility of its customers. Ford has been using technology to shape the future of transportation for over 100 years and is dedicated to solving the world's most pressing mobility issues. What you might not know is that Ford has a series of divisions that make these visions a reality. Ford X is Ford's venture incubator, that unites entrepreneurs, designers, and engineers to shape the future of transportation. Ford's City Innovations team brings innovative ideas to life through community workshops, crowdsourcing initiatives, and citywide mobility challenges. And Spin, a property of Ford, brings e-scooter sharing to cities and college campuses. So here's your call to action. To learn more about Ford's work in mobility, autonomous vehicles, and their global efforts to improve mobility for its customers, visit corporate.ford.com. That's corporate.ford.com. Thanks again to Ford for sponsoring independent media like this podcast. Welcome back to the Inside Transportation Podcast. I'm here with Michael Bertov, the CEO and founder of GeoOrbital. So GeoOrbital, like you mentioned, is a wheel that has a motor and a battery inside of it that takes, you know, 30 seconds to retrofit a regular bike into an electric bike. You literally just pop off the front wheel and you put our wheel on. Um, but the technology itself is extremely versatile. So our go-to-market was bicycles, um, regular adult-sized bicycles. Mm -hmm. But we also have uh, we also have deployments and prototypes and paths to ma making electric wheelchairs from manual wheelchairs at a fraction of the price of where they are now. Um, cool. A different wow. type of mobility, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the challenges with so the bikes are bikes are a very unique space, and I think we'll get into uh, all of the challenges and the opportunities in the urban mobility space. But there's a lot of attention on it, right? There's a lot of resources, a lot of excellent people. And a lot of the, a lot of the innovation that happens is very iterative. So it's small changes here or there, right? Bikes mm -hmm. as a form factor have been around for over 100 years. Electric bikes have been a, a, around for over 100 years. So what you see now, and, and, and people are kind of shocked to hear this, but the first patents for electric bikes were in the 1800s. Um, mm -hmm. And... It, it's it's amazing how much they've evolved and it's amazing how much they haven't at the same time. But since there is so much customer demand, and by the way, bicycles are the most popular vehicle in the world uh, by far, and electric bicycles are the most popular electric vehicle in the world. Yes, also especially now with the pandemic, which we'll jump into in a bit. So. Yeah, absolutely, right? So, but that, because that industry is so popular, so massive, there's a lot of really talented people and there's a lot of cash in it now. Uh, and is getting a lot of attention. Other industries like wheelchairs really haven't gotten a lot of attention and they really, the market just isn't really there. So you still see technology, you know, better suited to the 1970s powering modern day electric wheelchairs. And that's, that's an industry you wanna get into, um, that we are into. Um, also fleet applications, delivery, um, other applications like that. Um, so. Yeah, so our path right now is very diverse. I mean, our platform can power everything from cars, making regular cars into electric cars, to wheelchairs. It's an extremely diverse platform. 
I see. So let, let's jump in a little bit more about the pandemic, right? Because, you know, right now, um, there's a lot of people who may be apprehensive about taking public transport. And that's a topic we often discuss on this podcast is that we might see a shift of people going from subways or going from public buses into personal vehicles or into micro mobility. Um, you know, one of, one of my co-host, Jason, he's actually a big proponent of like scooters kind of seeing this moment, right? Um, what, where do you see micromobility progressing after the pandemic? Do you think that this is going to be a part of our new normal? So I'm going to answer this cryptically. I'm going to say yes and no. Mm -hmm. So yes, people are going to, uh, well, not going to, they are. People are avoiding subways. They're avoiding buses. Uh, they're avoiding public transportation. If this pandemic had lasted a month, I think we'd be back to normal, right? Because normally we're social creatures. We like being next to each other. Uh, it's been around since we evolved, you know, like right. homo sapiens are just social. We gather in groups. We do things together. This pandemic at this point has been going on for about six months, I want to say, in the States, um, longer in some other places in the world. It might go on for another six months for all we know. Like, who knows, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to know how our collective psyche is going to change. But at this point, we do have the shared scarring um, that we have. So people even now are more uh, hesitant to be in close proximity to people they're not comfortable with. Uh, you, you don't really see people standing that close to each other on the street anymore. You don't see people uh, standing closer to each other in supermarkets. So social distancing has become um, normal now. It's become something that we have disciplined ourselves to do without really giving it much thought. Now, there's definitely exceptions to that in different parts of the states and the world. But as a general rule, I think people are more hesitant um, on some level to be close to somebody else. Now, this affects public transportation quite a bit. I believe personally that public transportation is still a very efficient way to get around, especially for long distances. And by long distances, I mean over a couple of miles, so nothing right. crazy. But uh, micromobility is for that mile, two mile, maybe five mile ride. That being said, there's a lot of effort putting being put into scooters over the last two years. There's a lot of effort. The e-bike industry right now is kind of exploding. It's having a big renaissance. The challenge with that industry is that it's also oversaturated at this point. And mm. like I mentioned, funding is super difficult to get. Um, and a lot of companies are very opportunistic. So they might have gotten something else. And this is, a, this is a challenge with more how venture capital works and how these companies get funding. So all of the scooters, uh, like the, the scooter share companies and the e-bike share companies that are blowing up, they're all venture backed. Uh, right. And the, one of the challenges with getting venture backed funding is that if a venture capital fund invested in a company that was flailing uh, or that was having difficulty right now, they would very well force that company to go into a market that's growing, like making electric bikes, like making electric scooters. And I can name you a number of companies that have gotten a lot of pressure from their investors to pivot to that type of business model. And it's one of the f most fascinating things in the industry is that venture capital right now or the primary mechanisms for funding innovation are not really actively getting new deals in. So they're not actively promoting or investing into new companies. Most of the capital right now is going to saving their current companies, the companies that they're already invested in. Uh, they're putting in more and more money into their current portfolio companies just to keep them afloat because a lot of them are losing revenue because of this pandemic. And a lot of that keeping companies afloat means pivot to a market which is hot. Pivot to a market where you can make revenue. And right now that market is e-bikes. Right now that market is scooters. Um, so we see a lot more competition right now, especially from the venture-backed companies entering into the space. On one hand, it's great because there's a lot more innovation. There's a lot more capital happening in the space. On another hand, it's also it's very confusing for the consumer. Um, and the technology that they're entering the market with is not necessarily the best technology. It's just the technology they have that they were forced to apply to this, uh, to this use case by their investors a lot of the time. So in essence, I guess that's, that's the yes and no. I do believe that people will want to have autonomous transportation. Mm -hmm. um, scooters and, and bikes are becoming more and more popular. But right now, all the, the capital that is funding all of this innovation, it will dry up. Uh, and then you see a lot more consolidation in the industry, which we're already seeing. Um, and then at some point, it's just these business models are not sustainable uh, because they're venture backed. So as soon as the VC pull out, these companies can't pay their bills. 
they won't be able to raise another round of funding. And we're already seeing companies right now, scooter companies, that are fundamentally flawed as businesses. Uh, but they have a lot of venture capital money so they can operate for now. But as businesses, they're not making any money. So they're just going to go away. Uh, that's one of the reasons that Uber shut down their e-bike shares. It's mm -hmm. just as a business, it didn't make any sense. So that's the challenge with, with the funding uh, element of what I was talking about, about bringing innovation to market. Uh, it's kind of a global approach where it's really not specific to transportation, but right now it's really prevalent in the urban mobility space just because there's a lot of venture funding going into it. We're going to take a quick break here on the Inside Transportation podcast, and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to thank Fenwick and West. They're one of the world's first and leading law firms dedicated to technology and life sciences. They operate in the fast lane of innovation where ideas often outpace changes in the law. That's where you find Fenwick's autonomous transportation and shared mobility practice, steering startups, technology giants, and major automotive companies through rapidly evolving legal, business, and regulatory challenges, which we talk about here on Inside Transportation all the time. A Silicon Valley original, Fenwick is a national law firm with offices in Mountain View, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Santa Monica, and even Shanghai. So here's your call to action. Learn more about how Fenwick can help companies tackle the complex legal and business issues of autonomous transportation at Fenwick.com. That's F-E-N-W-I-C-K.com. Thanks again to Fenwick for providing great legal services to me. I use them personally uh, for, and for our investments and uh, for supporting independent media like Inside Transportation. Let's get back to this amazing episode. And we're back here with Michael Bertov of Geo Orbital here on the Inside Transportation podcast. Yeah, so... Like you were kind of mentioning, I mean, the U.S. has seen a record number of electric bike sales recently. Um, obviously, we're all kind of stuck at home looking for things to do. Um, for instance, I just bought a kayak. I never thought in a million years oh, I would buy a kayak. But nice. let me ask you this. Do you think that the future of electric bikes is going to be focused on personal vehicle ownership? Or do you think it's going to be more of this shared model that's being pushed out by Lime and, and Lyft and other companies? So I think realistically, it would be great if it was shared, but as businesses, I don't think those companies can be sustainable without constant infusions of capital. Uh, mm. And those infusions of capital are very fleeting. Uh, venture capitalists, the people who fund Lime and Jump and whoever, uh, they're not going to be in that space when there's another hot space for them to throw their money into. And we're already seeing companies fail. There's a Boston-based company, Zagster, that recently had a fire sale, which made uh, bike shares, um, to a company called Super Pedestrian, which now makes right. scooters because their investors said you have to make scooters now because the other line of business you're in is flailing. So the, the challenge is that I think the things that take off are fundamentally sound. They're fundamentally good businesses. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas, but if you can't make a business out of it, if you can't be fundamentally profitable and sustainable, it's just not going to stick around. And that's honestly the reason that Jump, or when they got bought out by Uber, got devastated. They got destroyed because as a business, they just didn't make any sense. And so right now you can go to some landfills and see thousands of Uber bikes, the electric bikes. They just dumped them. And yeah, I mean, I personally think it's a travesty. Out. That is just awful that they did that. But Did that hurt you just seeing all those bikes oh, in the landfill? <laughs> Oh man, it was it was it was gut wrenching. I mean, like donate them to like a developing country or something. Jesus, right. what are you thinking, Uber? I, I think they ended I up it was covering disgusting. some of those bikes, and I think like there's a bike share in Buffalo, New York, that was able to to get some. But yeah, I think most of them were just thrown away into a landfill, which was insane. <laughs> yeah, they salvaged some batteries and some they didn't. And by salvage, I mean they, re they I mean they destroy them in, in a recyclable way. I mean, there's so much need for transportation. So. If you look at just economic development, the labor mobility, as the UN calls it, as the ability from a, for, of a person to, from, to get from the place they live to the place they work, that is one of the highest predictors of economic success, right? So um, it, cities in the U.S., internationally, wherever, if, if there's mobility, if, if workers can sw go from one neighborhood to another for a job easily— that's a huge predictor of economic success. And it was one of the main challenges when you're developing international economies. E-bikes are amazing for this. And Uber had thousands of them. But instead of donating them to helping people live better lives all around the world, and even in the U.S., 
they decided to throw them out. I thought it was a travesty. I thought it was disgusting that they did that. But the reason they did that, again, is their venture capital um, model of sustaining their company. Right. Um, so one question for you. We see all of these automakers um, like Tesla, Volkswagen, Nissan kind of say, hey, we're going to really increase the amount of electric vehicles we're going to be producing between now and 2030. Um, we see EV mandates in Europe, EV mandates in China. Um, do you, you know, as somebody who has worked with these like electric vehicle battery supply chains, do you think we're kind of going to face this reckoning in the next few years where we might not have enough materials to build electric vehicle batteries? Well, yeah, we're already having them. I mean, it, the stuff that needs to be mined out of the ground, uh, we need to mine it ethically, which is already a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we need these are these are natural resources. Um, but I think the challenge is not that's definitely a challenge. Having batteries and efficient batteries, uh, lithium polymer style batteries that are prominent now and more advanced chemistries that are coming out is really, really important. Uh, but the challenge to Tesla and to Volkswagen and to Jaguar and to everybody else who's making these huge pushes for electric vehicles um, is that they're just not affordable um, if you weren't to, if you were not going to subsidize them. So in the in in Tesla's case, I mean Tesla, I think just recently turned a profit, and that was very accidental. Uh, for the most part, Tesla has been losing money, and the way you can lose money. Uh, while making a product is by taking on investors again. So it's that access to capital thing. Right. So in te I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm guessing, you know, out of every $10 that hits Tesla's bank account, eight or nine of them comes from outside investment, not from sales. Every time you buy a Tesla car, it's subsidized by some VC or private equity fund and it's subsidized heavily. So, or, you know, by other investors. So fundamentally, I think electric cars are great. I think it is the future of transportation, but right now we just don't have the cost structure to be able to make them profitably. Um, so all of these companies that are doing it, they're they're siphoning money from their, you know, like VW is siphoning money from their other operations to subsidize their electric cars. Mm -hmm. uh, Rivian, which is you know coming out with a uh, competing uh, pickup truck, you know, next to the Cyber Truck, the Tesla one, um, right. they're heavily invested into. You know, Tesla is way invested into. So invested into. So yeah, I think the challenge is, yes, I think the future is electric. I think we will be running out of natural resources, just like we are with petrol powered uh, vehicles. But uh, the challenge is, I think more than that is that capital. So while this is a hot space, while investors are interested, perhaps raising that capital is possible. But once they move on to something else, you, we're just going to see a catastrophe similar to the catastrophe that we're seeing in the scooter world. All these electric car companies are not immune to it because their business model depends on investment much more than it does on making uh, profits from sales. Well, I will say, I mean, my personal opinion on that is that there's probably going to be just a few players in the space, right? Um, so right now, I mean, we see that there's companies like Nikola, Fisker, um, you know, a lot of these smaller players in the electric vehicle uh, space. And while they have received some investment, especially, I mean, they just filed IPOs as well. Right. I, I just don't see them surviving past like a Tesla or a Volkswagen who's, a, you know, had so much backing and so much support and they have the sales to back it up as well. Right. I mean, you know, even though Tesla may be subsidized by like this outside investment they've been accumulating over the years, they do have like some level of consumer interest or, or sales to kind of back that up. Right. Um, so I just don't really see like uh, Lordstown Motors or some of these other companies that are in the space kind of making it through the storm unless, you know, the one, the one silver lining, I think, for some of these companies, is I'm sure, you know, you might have some insight on this as well in the EV and the electric bike space is like these corporate or enterprise accounts. Right. Because I know um, Nikola signed like a deal recently with a trash truck provider that's worth a few million dollars. Right. Um, and you never really think about it, but there's so many different applications or different vehicles that can be electrified that haven't been electrified yet. Right. Um, I don't know if you have any insights on that or any uh, take there. Yeah, absolutely. I, you're absolutely right. I mean, the form factors of larger vehicles are much better equipped for handling uh, the, you know, the large capacity requirements, uh, large weight requirements that electric batteries need. So a bus is a more fitting thing to be electrified than a car just because it has more space for the batteries 
uh, it has fewer weight, you know, restrictions, things like that. Um, as far as far as you know, the the business and the, the, the you know what technology is going to survive, I'm completely with you. A lot of these smaller players are not going to be around. Uh, they're launching IPOs because they need capital, they need investors. That's that's the reason that they're doing it, and they can't survive without it. Uh, Tesla is actually kind of unique, I think. And you might, you know, I'd love to hear your point on uh, your your take on it as well. I actually don't think Tesla is a car company. Uh, I think Tesla is a software company. It's a connected device company. So that's mm. kind of the unique part of what Tesla is. Yes, they have this hardware which is visible, which lets them connect with people. It's that car you physically sit in and you touch. But what they're actually doing is developing software. They're developing autonomous driving stuff. And by the way, not really the hardware. They're using relatively cheap hardware, but they're developing the software. So I think the unique thing about Tesla, and, I, and don't get me wrong, Tesla loses a ton of money on every car they sell. But what they're developing, their value, isn't the car. I, I don't think there's actually much revolutionary stuff about the actual vehicles that they make. Um, they, they are, they definitely have a very strong brand. They have a charger network that they're pioneering. There's a, there's a lot of business process innovation that they have going on. But the most amazing thing, from my take, that they're doing is actually the software. So, yeah, I, I think Tesla is unique in that because the other ones are making cars. Tesla is making software to power cars. And it, it, yeah, it is kind of interesting because if you look at a company like Fisker, so Fisker is coming back from the dead and they're making these electric vehicles and they're actually not even making the cars. They're, they're contracting Magna, which is a auto supplier to make them in Austria. Uh, and so they, they're, they're like every EV company is kind of taking like a different approach. I think what you're basically suggesting is that the fact that Tesla's developing this uh, software, which is the autopilot driving suite, right? Like that puts them in the hard, like the software business. Um, it, that's a really good point because Elon recently did express an interest to license this technology to other companies. And when you see what other companies are kind of doing in the software space, it has a lot to be desired, right? Um, sure. and, and, you know, on this podcast, we've actually discussed like, hey, you know, the fact that Tesla is rolling out this technology, this autopilot technology to its entire fleet of vehicles and they're getting data and insights from every one of their cars that uses that software and are able to track every time they like the driver has to disengage instead of deploying like 20,000 cars like Waymo plans to to kind of test out its technology Tesla kind of has like a like a leg up on them right um so oh, yeah. you know my my personal thoughts is when it comes to EVs just like we see Apple versus Android, we're basically going to be seeing Tesla versus everyone else, right? So there's going to yeah. be some type of universal driving software that Tesla might just keep onto their own vehicles or maybe even roll out to other automakers. But um, I think it's going to really just be like Tesla versus everyone else on this kind of universal OS that's going to be rolled out to all those vehicles. Um, that's just my personal thought. But I, uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. Tesla is going to be the OS, the operating system for cars. I think that is the point of what's going on right now. Um, yeah, it's like they are where Android was when Android started. Mm -hmm. uh, or Amazon Web Services too, or right? AWS. Like, yeah. Exactly. That's so. Yeah, I I think so. If you talk about like stock prices, right? So everybody keeps talking about you know Tesla is an auto manufacturer and they keep valuing their stock as you know compared to other. And by the way, it's the largest auto manufacturer right now as an auto manufacturer. But that's mm -hmm. not their value. That's not what they make. I think the car, the actual vehicle, is actually kind of an afterthought. It's the packaging um, for their actual product. It's it's the box that their software comes in. Um, and that's a un that's kind of a unique model. I mean, you see this a lot with other high tech startups, with other high tech companies. Uh, but Tesla is particularly good at it. I actually think they're completely hardware agnostic. They don't need to make electric cars. They can just put their software on a Ford, and it'll run just as well, like a gasoline powered one. So I think what they did from a branding perspective, make you know cool, high performing electric cars, is awesome. But that's not the value of the company. Um, and others, like you said, Waymo is entirely a software company. They don't even bother with the hardware stuff. Well, I mean, a little bit, but not really, right? The, the hardware that they're limited to is their sensors, while as Tesla right. uses you know, cheap LiDAR uh, that you can get retail. Um, so 
I think, but if you look at, if you compare, if you're benchmarking Tesla to other other manufacturers like Volkswagen, which actually cares about cars, they don't care at all about software, or if you, or Ford that's making electric, or everybody that's making electric, they're car companies. They're making something completely different than what Tesla is making. So I think you're absolutely right. In the future, or now, because I honestly think as soon as regulation catches up, we're just going to have self-driving cars everywhere, powered by Tesla, because they're the light years ahead of everybody else, Tesla will just sell it. And they'll make much more money selling software than they ever did by losing money by selling cars. They just like they sell, sell like EV credits, too. I mean, exactly. that's, how, yeah. that's a big point of revenue for them, is just selling these electric vehicle credits to other automakers. Um, I guess, yep. you know, yep. another question for you here. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap things up. But um, in the next 10 years, I think we're going to see a massive transformation as far as the adoption of EVs in the United States. Um, what do you think would help as far as legislation to kind of allow for more adoption of electric vehicles, whether it's personal micro mobility bikes or scooters um, or, you know, the big, uh, you know, the big SUVs that we might be seeing on the roads are going to be powered by electric batteries? What are some of your thoughts? Well, I think for there's two different there's uh, there's this number of different challenges. I think cars versus electric cars, we're going to have gasoline powered cars in the streets forever, right? They're, we're never going to switch to all electric. But I think you know there need to be subsidies, there need to be special incentives for people to buy electric. There needs to be a charging infrastructure. But that we're still talking about cars. Um, but yes, I think cars, electric cars, when they're more affordable when they're more accessible when they're easier to charge when battery technology catches up and by the way battery technology now can support a very rapid charging high capacity battery pack it's just that mm. it's not affordable so mm. the stuff that tesla makes the, the, the batteries that they make the new ones they're still based on very old technology uh, it's just that that is now cheap and you can make it at scale for an affordable price and you can pack it into a car uh, but yeah, there are much more advanced battery chemistries that charge really quickly that have very high capacity, but they're just not even remotely affordable. Uh, so I think it's, it's the, that there's going to be a series of technological breakthroughs that make things work. And if you think about it, really, batteries are the biggest problem with all of the equipment that we use now, whether it's your cell phone, laptop, your home, whatever the case. The battery is the, probably the most challenging part of any technological connected device innovation you know anything that has a physical component ha pretty much runs on a battery these days and that's really the biggest hurdle to pretty much everything that we use i mean you look at an iphone it's like 90 percent battery and mm -hmm. it still sucks right the battery still dies throughout the day and 90 percent of that iphone is the battery right so so yeah so that's the problem with electric cars i think there needs to be a series of technological innovation but there also needs to be government funding for that innovation this needs to be the universities need to get funding to study these things, to mass produce these things. And the government isn't doing that. Uh, or at least right. the current administration isn't really doing that. But outside of that, I also think there needs to be more infrastructure on the roads. Um, so bike lanes are crazy important, and but they exist. People know about it. But where does a scooter go? Right. Like that, that, you know, there's so much scooter. of a gray area there. It, exactly. Yeah, because it, right. Because it's like, OK, some cities will say, hey, if you have a scooter, it has to be on the street. Right. Other cities say it has to be on the sidewalk. And, and then what I often see is just people, you know, driving their scooters on uh, like a bike lane. Right. Yep. And then you kind of get into the question of like, well, if you have an electric powered scooter running at like 25 miles per hour in the bike lane, then you're going to see some, you know, effects to the people who are biking. Right. Um, yep. Some safety issues, possibly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely a crazy like gray area in so and many you know, cities. You know how that started? That started uh, in New York, which is still has crazy laws regarding uh uh, you know, a micro mobility device, but it started with Segway. So when Segway came out, uh, if you remember, it was this big hulking device. Yeah. Um, and they're saying they were advertising it as an alternative to walking. Uh, that was mm. their marketing marketing material. It went like three to five miles an hour. And all of their marketing materials were like, use it on the sidewalk next to regular people. But you have this like 800 pound device that's just lumbering along. Uh, that people don't really know how to use because it's awkward and it's like in the middle of a crowded sidewalk. So some, you know, people, you know, not so smart people were doing this in New York and those accidents. So New York is like, okay, screw this. No more weird, unregisterable 
electric vehicles. Like if you can't take it to the registry of motor vehicles, we're not allowing it. Period. Full stop. No scooters, no e-bikes, no segways. We're done with this nonsense. So and that kind of started a trend, right? Like so now, like if I'm walking down a sidewalk, a crowded sidewalk, which obviously doesn't exist during a pandemic, but let's assume right. the pandemic ends at some point and we have crowded sidewalks again. I don't want to be next to a Segway. I don't want to be next to a scooter. I don't want to be next to an e-bike. Now, they shouldn't be on the road next to the cars either, right? Like, so where do they go? And cities haven't been very proactive in doing that. Uh, there's cities that ban electric bikes from bike lanes, too. I mean, there's just yeah. such a patchwork of regulation. And, you know, you know, there's also different classes of e-bikes that nobody really can wrap their head around, especially not the people enforcing these rules. You know, some classes of e-bikes can be allowed on, e on, on bike lanes, some are not. Um, so, yeah, so I think there needs to be clarity. There needs to be kind of a national discussion about uh, what do we do? This form of transportation exists. Electric skateboards exist. We can't just forget mm -hmm. about them. We need to figure out where do they go. Uh, you can do what New York did up until this year and just say outright ban them. They didn't really enforce the ban that well, but it was just outright banned. Um, or you can do things that other places have done and just allow all of them into this like urban, like uh, micro mobility lane, which we, you share bikes and scooters and skateboards, which is also a mess. So, yeah, for micro mobility, there needs to be infrastructure. There needs to be um recognition that there are other ways to commute to get around that are between cars and walking uh, and those ways are popular enough when we need to account for them cities need to have revenue structures that can profit from them so cities make a lot of money from cars obviously mm -hmm. from cars operating on their street they need to make some money from scooters and bikes they have solutions like that in europe um, Do you think are, that's are... why they haven't really taken the initiative to kind of think about this because there's no money being made on their end because i mean we saw with electric scooter companies too right um all these scooter companies just drop scooters or bikes on sidewalks and cities were complaining about them until they created like a formal kind of pilot program where they were benefiting from it financially to some extent i mean do you think that's why they don't care or why they haven't created the, those laws or regulations well, yeah. I mean, when you when the when the scooter started in this country, right? It was it was a couple of Chinese companies, uh, well, Chinese backed companies. Uh, they just had you know crazy amounts of cash, and they just dropped scooters everywhere, right? So they were disruptive, as they would say in the startup world, mm -hmm. um, because they didn't care. They had the cash; they could just drop scooters. And if the city wanted to sue them, that's fine. They'll just battle the lawsuit, kind of how Uber launched, right? They just launched without asking permission, and they could afford to do that. And yeah, cities didn't care. Well, they didn't have a way to deal with them. There's really nothing illegal about just dropping a whole bunch of scooters on the street. Then they made laws, then they made these registers, then they gave exclusive contracts to some manufacturers over other manufacturers. And yeah, they figured out a way to make money and now they care about it. And you're, I completely agree with you. If it's hard to motivate somebody to do something unless there is some money to be made in it, uh, whether it's you know, on a municipal level or even you know, in a lot of cases on a personal level. You know? So yes, I think cities need to be able to make money off scooters um, and there needs to be a conversation like how do we do that uh, pot didn't become legal until there was a way to make money off of it you know marijuana <laughs> so it's really the same conversation like that nobody really cares uh, until there's some money in it for them um, so yeah absolutely we can't just ignore it it's a real thing it exists um, people can make money off of it and until there's a clear picture of how they can do that I don't think they'll account for them. And it's, by the way, and until they do, this type of transportation is inherently relatively dangerous. Um, it's relatively inaccessible mm -hmm. until cities start figuring out an infrastructure for it. Yes. Well, wrapping things up here, I, I, I think I took too much of your time, but um, oh, no, what are some lessons you would give to a founder of somebody who wants to create a groundbreaking transportation startup? Because I know so many of our listeners might have an idea. They might have an idea for a company or a startup that works in the transportation space. What, what kind of lessons would you share with them today on this podcast? Well, there's a lot. Uh, there is really a lot. Um, I would, I mean, I would, I'm going to plug my book again, The Evergreen Startup. <laughs> Feel free to. You deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. So, the, I mean, I talk a lot about kind of the shortcuts and the pro tips and the secrets to launching and getting funding for an idea in The Evergreen Startup. 
by the way, I also teach it at the MIT Enterprise Forum, where I'm an instructor, an innovation instructor, and I'm on the board there as well. So it's it's kind of a book that's went through, that's been through a lot of entrepreneurs and has helped people raise a lot of capital. But the the challenge is really access to money, and it's not it's not as hard as it seems at first. Our resources and outside validation and just having the psychological drive to get your revolutionary idea to market is probably the most challenging thing. So it's silly as this sounds and it sounds very nebulous is don't give up. Um, the, the number of the most challenging thing about a startup is being kind of in that gray zone. Like do I go forward or do I close down? And you never want to be in that gray zone. So you always, and that's a psychological thing. So you always want to be moving forward. You always want to be, you know, raising capital or support from people around you. So that's the one advice I would do. And that's not necessarily just related to transportation startups. It's any kind of startup in general. You always want to be moving forward and you have to love what you do. As soon as you stop loving what you do, uh, you're done. Uh, you know, the currency of a startup is the happiness that that startup brings you. And if you're not happy, if that morale isn't there, then your startup has no more currency to work with. Wow, well spoken. So we were sitting with Michael Bertov, the inventor, entrepreneur, founder, CEO of Geo Orbital, um, as well as other projects as well. And we're going to put a link to his uh book in our show notes but thank you so much michael for joining us this was an amazing uh discussion and i look forward to speaking with you again soon i hope you might want to visit us again here on the podcast thank you i'd love to thank you for having right. me awesome take care thank you Bye bye.